up your Bible. Let's make our confession over the Word. I thank you, Father, that your Word has the power to change my life. Today I give heed to it. I allow it to go into my ears, then into my mind, and then into my spirit. I'm a hearer of the Word and a doer of the Word, and I'll never be the same. After today, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And I do want to make this announcement also, uh, even though they are not here, but in uh, our next service, second service, uh, Audrey Rigg will be in attendance. Um, Audrey is the newborn daughter of Riley and Jen Rigg, who are on our staff, and so we're excited for them and uh, excited for us uh, and our new addition to the church and to their family. Um, we have been in a series, this is the fourth Sunday, in a series on the tabernacle, and uh, I'm here inside the what's known as the uh, holy place. Out here there is a curtain that goes all the way around the holy place, and then there's a veil that goes into the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was, and uh, you can, uh, if you've seen Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know what's in there, and we don't take the top off of that ever. Um, but out here in the outer court, before you go inside, there was a, uh, a courtyard. It was separated from the rest of the tribes of Israel by a seven and a half, high, um, seven and a half foot high curtain made out of linen that went all the way around. It was uh, seven and a half feet high. As I said, it was uh, 75 feet wide and 150 feet long. And at the east end was the only entrance. And when you came in, there was the brazen altar where the sacrifices were made. And when you came in and you brought your sacrifice, that's as far as you got was to the altar. The priest would take your sacrifice, offer your sacrifice. And then before they offered the sacrifices or before they went into the holy place, they would wash here at this, uh, at this uh, basin, this uh, called the bronze laver. So we have a bronze altar and we have a bronze laver. And this represents cleansing. The laver represents cleansing from sin. The, <clears throat> the, uh, arc, the um, bronze altar represents Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for our sins so that we could be free, the sacrifice that he made. And once the sacrifice was made, you see, the sacrifice was made, but the sacrifice has to be accepted. The sacrifice was made, but then here, the purity of that sacrifice for your cleansing had to actually be acknowledged and accepted. Some people feel like that Jesus died for all the sins of everybody in the whole world, which is absolutely true. He did, and at the same time, that sacrifice has to be acknowledged. You're not going to show up in heaven one day and go, oh, really? Je Jesus did what? Well, you know, I always heard that, but I never really thought there was much to it. But here I am, and that's great. It covers my sins. No, we have to actually acknowledge and receive that sacrifice that he made uh, that the, the brazen altar represents. And so that's what, you know, the sacrifice was made, but the purity has to be accepted. And once that's accepted, then we are free to go into now the holy place. One thing I want to... Uh, just point out is that everything out here in the courtyard is bronze. Everything in the holy place and the most holy place is gold, solid gold. Today, we're going to be talking about this lampstand right here. Um, it's important that we acknowledge what's happening in the tabernacle because the tabernacle, there is actually an earthly uh, tabernacle and a heavenly tabernacle. And this tabernacle is a model of what's in heaven. We're going to see in just a moment, we're going to start seeing about the lampstand that's in heaven. So as we enter behind this curtain into the holy place, the first thing that we might notice in this holy place is the, light, the fact that there's light in here. If you come in, the priests came in twice a day. They came in morning and evening to put oil in the lamps, to, uh, to take care of the, uh, the altar of incense, to take care of the different things that were here. And uh, the first thing that you might notice, although there's a lot of gold, a lot of stuff going on here, is that there's a light in here, that this is all lit up by this uh, lamp stand. 
And I want to point out one more time, I've said this several times, but this is not a candlestick. It's not a golden candlestick, as you hear some people say. And even some of your translations that you're reading will say, we'll talk about a golden candlestick. It's not a candlestick. It is a lamp stand. And every morning and every evening, the, one of the priests would come in and put oil in the lamp stand. And this lamp stand was to burn perpetually, day and night. It was to never go out, but they were to trim the wicks and to um, uh, put oil in the lampstand uh, twice a day to keep the thing burning. Oil in the Bible always represents the Holy Spirit. And so this lampstand represents when we're in the holy place and we're talking about intercession uh, uh, two Sundays from now, we'll be talking about the altar of incense and we'll be talking about intercession and the oil in the lamp always represents the Holy Spirit. Oil in the Bible anytime uh, pretty much represents the Holy Spirit. So in Exodus chapter 25, if you found that, Exodus 25, in verse 31, when God is giving Moses the uh, instructions for building the tabernacle and furnishing it, he says, you shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work, its shaft its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs and flowers shall be of one piece. And six branches shall come out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand out of one side and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. So we see here we have a, a lampstand. Um, this lampstand has seven uh, places to be lit, not nine. The When you uh, see a menorah, at Hanukkah time, around uh, our Christian holiday of Christmas, they have a menorah that has nine, uh, nine places. It's actually a candlestick. They light candles, and it has nine places. And this one has seven. The nine places has to do with the history of Israel and the Maccabean Revolt, and we're, we're not going to get into all that history today. The one that was in the tabernacle in the wilderness had seven, uh, seven uh, places. And... So, uh, and as I said, it was a lamp stand because it, was, it didn't have candle wax. It had oil that represented the Holy Spirit. So then if you go to verse 37 of this same chapter, and this whole thing is all about the lamp stand, but let's go down to verse 37. You shall make seven lamps for it, so they shall arrange its lamps so that they give light in front of it. And its wick trimmers and their trays shall be out of pure gold. It shall be made of a talent of pure gold with all these utensils, and see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. So God showed Moses a pattern, and that pattern is not written here, so there are all kinds of different ideas as to what this lampstand looked like. Some people feel like it was bigger, much bigger, it was this wide. Some people feel like it was smaller like this. Some people even put the, don't put the, um, the lamps in a row, but rather there are two on this side and two on this side and two in the middle. So there are all different ways that people have made this. Moses got a pattern from God on Mount Sinai of what this looked like, just like the one in heaven. And that's how he instructed them to make this lampstand. And it was to be made. Now the lampstand and its utensils, its snuffers and its wick trimmers and all that stuff, everything was to be made out of pure gold, a talent of pure gold. Now, take a deep breath. Because a talent of pure gold is um, 75 pounds. 75 pounds of gold. That's 1,200 ounces of gold. And yesterday, gold was, was $1,178 an ounce, which means the lampstand and its trimmers and snuffers and everything that went with it, the tray and everything that went with it, today would cost $1,413,600 just for this lampstand and the utensils that went with it. How many of you know that God's into excellence? So... Pastor Steve, I can't believe you spent that much on that. Wait till I make a lamp stand and see how much I spend on that. All right, so uh, anyway, the lamp stand had seven lamps, and, uh, it, and the lamps represent the seven characteristics of the Spirit of God. I want you to go with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 1, and we're going to talk about the lamp stands that are in heaven. 
the lampstands that are in heaven. In the book of Revelation, chapter 1, as I've told you, this whole tabernacle, the outer court, everything that's, that you see here is all represented in heaven. And Moses got this pattern for the, uh, the tabernacle from God who wanted him to, and he wanted everything built just so. The measurements and the colors and everything had to be built to exact specifications because Moses was duplicating something that already existed, already exists in heaven and exists there today. And so in Revelation chapter 1, have you found it? Revelation chapter 1 verse 12 John says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. So we see here that Jesus, and it goes on to describe Jesus standing in heaven amidst these seven golden lampstands. And in verse 18, Jesus says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So, well, Pastor Steve, I thought you said the seven lampstands represent the Spirit of God. Well, hang on. Here, uh, here the angel tells John that the seven lampstands in heaven represent the seven churches. Now, if you go to verse 20... Um, uh, oh, no, we just read verse 20. Now you go to chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil, and that you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first work or else I will come to you quickly. Now watch this. And remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So the seven... Here in Revelation, we're not gonna we don't have time to do a whole study of the seven churches of Revelation. But each one of these lamps represents one of the seven churches of the book of Revelation. And here, the very first one is that he addresses is the church of Ephesus. And he writes a warning to the church of Ephesus about some things that they need to deal with. And we're not going to talk about the church of Ephesus and get into that today. But the thing that I want to point out is that in chapter 1, it says that each one of these lamps represents one of these seven churches. But then you see here, and the angel tells John... Um, uh, to write to the church of Ephesus and tell them if they don't straighten up that he is going to remove their lamp. So now think about, think about this just for a second that uh, he's writing to a church. If the, if the lamp is purely the church and that's all it stands for, then he's writing to the church and telling them I'm going to remove your church. He's writing to the church telling them he's going to remove their church, which doesn't make any sense. Oil in the Bible always re represents the Holy Spirit. If, now, I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 4, and I'm going to clear this up a little bit. I know some of you are looking at me a little wonky. Wonky is my new word, by the way. I was telling Dan earlier. Some of you are looking at me a little wonky. But in Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, <clears throat> gives us a little bit more, uh, a little bit more insight. Let's look at this. In Revelation 4, 5, uh, John is experiencing some of the things in heaven. And it says, And from the throne of God produced, proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So what, what Moses or what uh, the angel was telling John to write to the churches is, Tell the church to straighten up or, the, or we're going to remove the spirit from that church. We're going to remove the Holy Spirit from that church. And I, it's sad to say, I've been to churches where the Holy Spirit wasn't there. They had music, they had preaching, but the Holy Spirit wasn't there. He had, he had left the building a long time ago. Uh, if, the whole, if, the, if, the, 
If God ever takes the Holy Spirit from this church, I'm going wherever he goes. We're not staying in a dead church. Um, so this clears it up for us. These, these uh, seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Look at chapter 5 and verse 6. And John, said, John says this, And I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now, uh, go with me to Isaiah, book of Isaiah chapter 11. One of the great things about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. Omnipresent means the Holy Spirit can be everywhere all at one time. He can't, you know, it's not to say, well, the Holy Spirit's here. Holy Spirit can't be in another church because this morning he's at this church. But he can be everywhere. He can be in millions of people. He can be in millions of places. He can be wherever he wants to be all at the same time. It's called omnipresence. Everybody say omnipresence. omnipresence. So here it says that the seven spirits of God were sent over all of the earth. Now this is not talking about, this does not represent seven different Holy Spirits or seven different spirits, but represents the seven main attributes of the Spirit of God, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, it outlines those. In fact, let's start with verse 1. Do you have it? Isaiah 11, 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. This is talking about Jesus. This is a prophetic scripture about Jesus Christ. And it says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. These are the seven main characteristics of the Spirit of God. And so when the Spirit of God was sent from heaven into the earth, there are a lot of things we just got, we could, I have, I've taught six, eight, ten weeks on the Holy Spirit here before. We've got some of those still in the bookstore, I think. But here it outlines the seven main characteristics of the Spirit of God. Now, here when it talks about the Spirit of the Lord um, shall rest upon him, this word spirit, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel, the spirit, this word spirit, I want to talk about it for just a moment before I talk about the different attributes. The word spirit in the Hebrew, it's the Hebrew word ruach, ruach, and it literally means breath. The breath of God. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, it says God created man and then God breathed into his nostrils. And the life of God came into Adam. And the Bible says he became a living soul or a living being because of this breath, the power of breath. So breath, uh, so first of all, breath, God's life comes from breath. There was uh, one time when I'm sure the disciples kind of freaked out. This didn't make any sense to them. But Jesus says to his disciples, receive the spirit of God. The Bible says Jesus breathed on them. And then he said, receive the Spirit of God. <sighs> the life of God in his breath. Breath also creates an environment around where we're speaking. Anybody ever been in the environment of someone and their breath created that environment? <laughs> I, uh, I came home from, uh, it's been, I think it was Thursday, I came home from work. And, uh, you know, I gave Connie, I had eaten a salad at an Italian restaurant. So I came home and uh, greeted Connie. I gave her a kiss and she did that look, you know, that. So I, mean, I saw the look and I, you know, I know she enjoys kissing and we won't get into that. But, I, you know, I, I knew it wasn't the, I knew it wasn't the kiss that freaked her out, you know. And I, so I kissed her and she went. She did the, and then she caught herself. And I said, uh, <laughs> and I said, I, I'm trying to think of what, what could this be? And I said, is my breath okay? And she immediately said, no. <laughs> there is, ah, uh, you know, you could, you could use a man or what? I said, is my breath okay? No. 
Just like that. And I created an environment in our relationship <laughs> with my breath. I created a spirit. There was a spirit. And so when we're talking about, when, when the Bible talks about the seven spirits of God and the seven spirits of God coming from heaven into the earth, it's not talking about seven different spirits, seven different Holy Spirits. It's talking about the seven main attributes of the Holy Spirit who is omnipresent and can be everywhere all at the same time. Let's look at these for just a moment. It's the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of power, and the spirit of knowledge. Those seven spirits. So when um, these spirits, these, these attributes of the Holy Spirit are a result. I want to stop and say this. They are a result of being here in the holy place. They're the result of a relationship with Jesus Christ. One of my greatest concerns as a teaching pastor, there are apostolic pastors, there are prophetic pastors, there are evangelistic pastors. I, uh, for the most part, am a teaching pastor. And the, one, one of the biggest concerns in my ministry as a teaching pastor is that people are going to come and think that they're okay with God because they get the principles. Because my, my way of teaching, because I, that's, that's a particular gift that I operate in, is uh, seven ways to do this, five ways to do this, six ways to, uh, six ways to a better marriage, five ways to, to experience forgiveness, three ways to build a stronger relationship with God. And my, big, my greatest concern is that people will come to church here and they will sit here Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and get the principles, write the principles down and go home and try to put these principles together not understanding that all of the principles that, uh, that, uh, that are in the Word are designed to operate in the life of a person who has a relationship with Christ. And so we have to come, and how many times have I said this? 10 times, 15 times, 20 times. We have to come to the altar first and to the brazen altar first and we have to be sure that we're cleansed from sin. We can't do it ourselves. That's why we needed the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And once we are cleansed of our sin and remember 1 John 1, 9 that we talked about last week that says if, we, if after we become a Christian we sin, 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all, all unrighteousness. So that doesn't mean that we got to come back out here again and, well, here we are. And uh, it was, that was nice while it lasted, but I blew it last week and so now I'm out. No, it means thank God for the sacrifice. You just stay right here. You, stay, you don't have to go back. You stay right here and look at the cross and thank God for the cross. The Bible says confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But, but it's, it's, it's having the power of the Holy Spirit at work in your life. And the, it takes the Holy Spirit to make the principles of God effective. So, so you must... Have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not just about doing the do's and not doing the don'ts and being sure that you have all the notes in a row and, and all that stuff. That, that's all important in the life of a Christian. But you must have the power of the Holy Spirit at work in your life. And that only happens by being in here. And, and you only get in here because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in your life. So let's talk about these spirits for just a moment. The seven spirits of uh, God, first of all, is the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord. Now, the Spirit of the Lord, whenever you see the word Lord in the Bible, it's talking about the authority of Jesus. There are three main uh, ways that Jesus was addressed in the Bible. There is his name, Jesus. There is the word Christ, which means the anointed one or the Messiah. And then there is the word Lord. And so when you see Jesus referenced in the Bible, you will see him referenced as the Lord, as the Christ, or as Jesus. And when you see those things, it's referring to that passage depends upon the correct interpretation or the, the, the correct nuances and power of the verses that you're reading depend on you making those things, distinguishing between those three things. When it talks about uh, the Lord, it's talking about Jesus' authority. He is the Lord. He's the boss. He's the master. When it's talking about when it refers to him as Christ, it's talking about the anointed one, his anointing. 
and his anointing going forth, his power to heal and deliver. When you see him addressed as Jesus, it's referring to his humanity, Jesus as a human. He was fully human, yet he was fully God. How does that work? God knows that. And sometimes you see combinations of those. You'll see the Lord Jesus Christ. If you see a verse that calls him the Lord Jesus Christ, it's referring to his lordship, his humanity, and his anointing. Sometimes it just says the Lord Jesus. It's referring to his authority and his humanity. There is one verse in the Bible that calls him the Lord Christ. It's referring to his lordship and his anointing. Is this making sense? So here, the the first uh, the first of the, uh, the spirits that it addresses is the spirit of the Lord. This is referring to the environment in our lives of the lordship, of the authority of Jesus. And that's one thing that we have to come to grips with. If we're going to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we have to realize that he's the boss. Yes, I'll be involved in your life, but I am the boss. I am going to call the shots in your life. And sometimes we're good with that until it gets tough. Until he tells us to do something we don't particularly want to do. I see that at the marriage altar. You know, you know ladies, when, when we do a wedding here, uh, it, the, the wedding vows say, uh, are you going to love, honor, and obey your husband for the rest of your life? We want to get to the reception. We want to get to the honeymoon. We want to get, we want to get the ball rolling. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and so we do that sometimes you know if you if you make a decision to follow Christ then he's going to wash away all of your sins and heaven is going to be your home oh, who would turn that down but he also is the boss which means he tells us what to do with our time with, with our energy with our money he tells us what you know how our marriage should work and how to be a husband how to be a wife how to be a parent how to be a uh, how to be a, a son or daughter, how to be a student. I mean, all of the shots in our life are called by God because he's the Lord. He's the, but this should, be, this should be the spirit of the boss, I think, is what it should say. <laughs> then the second spirit, and the, and the Holy Spirit, by the way, let me go back a second. The Holy Spirit, there is an environment that we can create in our lives, in our homes, where, where people know that you are that that you're not the boss and that Jesus is. I was just listening to a CD by Brian Houston, the pastor of Hillsong Church in Australia, and he was talking about uh, some guys in the church coming to him, inviting him to. They were going to have a uh, uh, they were having a, a, a guys' night at one of the guys' house, and uh, they invited him to it. They were calling it boobs. Brews and barbecue. And the thing that, that shocked Brian Houston was that they didn't realize that, that, that he was concerned that he had not created an environment around himself where people would realize, that the guys in the church would realize that he wouldn't be comfortable with that. Y'all okay? Yeah. What well, I said, the B word, now y'all are freaked out apparently. I, <laughs> You know, but you create an environment around yourself where people understand that, that, uh, that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. He's the Lord of your family. He's the Lord of, of where you go and what you do and, and how you act. The words that come out of our mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He's the boss. He calls those shots. And I want to be that person. Not because I'm the pastor. Because I'm a Christian. No, don't ask, don't ask Pastor Steve to do that. He won't do that. He won't go there. He won't want to see that. Don't even ask him. He won't even want to see that movie. I want to be that Christian. Y'all okay? All right. Number two, the spirit of the Lord. Number two, the spirit of wisdom. Proverbs describes the spirit of wisdom numerous times. And wisdom, the the best way to define wisdom, the the book of Proverbs talks about uh, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. For us to pray that God would give us knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And those are those, and all three of those actually are that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of wisdom, and the spirit of understanding. All three of those are one of these lampstands here. 
And here it's uh, the second one is wisdom. And you could define wisdom as the correct way to use knowledge. There's knowledge. We're going to talk about it in a minute. Then there's wisdom, which is the correct way to use knowledge. And then there is uh, understanding, which is understanding why the knowledge works. So there's the what. Knowledge is the what? And then there's the wisdom, which is the how. And then there's the understanding, which is the why. And so the Holy Spirit is here called the spirit of wisdom. And wisdom is the correct way to use knowledge. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8, when it's talking about the seven gifts of the spirit, or the nine gifts of the spirit, <clears throat> it, it lists the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. And a word of knowledge is simply, simply knowing something by the spirit that you wouldn't ordinarily know naturally. And then the word of wisdom is knowing what to do with that knowledge that you get. I know, I know Christians that will run around the church all the time and say, hey, God showed me this, God showed me that. Listen, God shows me plenty of stuff. But most of the time, 90% of the time, it's not so I can come to you and tell you. I have to pray and ask the Holy Spirit. You know, so, uh, so the Holy Spirit shows me something about Kent and Linda Lindsay. And so I don't just run to him and blurt, you know, blurt, hey, guess what God told me? The first thing I got to do is pray and say, what am I supposed to do with this? Sometimes it's not to tell them. Sometimes it's to pray. Or sometimes maybe God shows you something about them and they're not the person that you need to deal with. It's somebody else you need to deal with on their behalf. There's a lot of different nuances to this. And that's what wisdom is. And the Bible says that one of the spirits of God, one of the attributes of God, is this operation of the uh, spirit of wisdom. And the Holy Spirit can create this environment around you so that, and wisdom, you know what wisdom really is? Our ability to, obe- to be obedient. To do what we actually know we're supposed to do. Wisdom actually is, it, it could be even called the spirit of obedience. To actually do what we know how to do. It's a, the Bible says that to, to know to do good and to not do it is sin. There are plenty of things that we know. A lot of people know that they should manage their money better. I shouldn't go here, should I? You know, we, that we, should, we should. It's one thing to know. Do you know how many millions of people in the United States have taken D- Dave Ramsey's uh, Financial Peace University? Millions of people. You know how many of them still have a budget? Probably four. It's, it's wisdom is... Um, The correct way to use knowledge. Number three, there's the spirit of understanding. And this is the spirit of why God works the way he does. Matthew chapter 13 verse 11, Jesus told his disciples, It has been given to us to know the mysteries of the operation of the kingdom of God. So pray for understanding. Ask the Holy Spirit to be that spirit to you, that spirit of understanding. I want to know why this works. I want to know why tithing works. I know tithing works. I want to know why. There is, there is knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Knowledge is knowing what tithing is. Wisdom is knowing how to do it and doing it. And then understanding is knowing why it works. So a lot of times we as Christians, we're just satisfied with, well, I, I have no idea how that works, but uh, at least God's doing it. But a spirit of understanding means we want to dig. We want to pray. We want to get into the word. We want to pray over the word. Take our prayer, uh, the word into our prayer closet and say, God, this is great. Thank you. I'm just, I'm so excited about this, but I want to know how, I want to know why this works like this. And when you know the why behind the what and the how, then that just solidifies it on the inside of you. Make sense? So then there's the spirit of understanding. Then the Holy Spirit is also the spirit of counsel. The Holy Spirit wants to give you direction. Jesus in, John, in the book of John describes the Holy Spirit as our 
counselor. And the Holy Spirit wants to create this environment around you, this breath of God, this life of God, this ruach. He wants to create this around you so that you have this environment of the counsel of God, that you're listening for the counsel of God, that you're listening to people in which God has put his wisdom, that you're listening to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you're obedient to the counsel of God you're, and you're creating that environment. I loved it the other day. Somebody, I was, I was talking with some guys, and uh, we were talking about, uh, we we're talking about something going on in the church and how we we're going to deal with it. And one guy said, "Why don't you do this?" And another guy said, "Why don't you do that?" And one of the guys said this. He said, "I can tell you one thing, Pastor Steve. When he deals with that, Pastor Steve is going to listen to the Holy Spirit, and he's going to do what the Spirit of God tells him to." That blessed my heart to hear that. That somebody recognized that quite possibly around me is this spirit of counsel. That the Holy Spirit is this spirit of counsel that I would listen to. And so all of us need to have that. Of course, I didn't want to just blurt out all the times that I missed it. But it's good to know that somebody recognizes that I'm making some very strong attempts to listen to the counsel of God. Then there is, the next one is the spirit of power. 1 Timothy 1.7 says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, the power of God. Listen, when you pray, when you, when you uh, have had your sins forgiven and you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus and you get in here where you are uh, participating in the life of God, the candlestick, or the candlestick, the lampstand, which uh, represents the Spirit of God. This table here we're going to talk about next week, which represents the Word of God. And, and you start making intercession and praying. And Hebrews chapter 10 says that we are entering into the presence of God, into the Holy of Holies. That's two weeks from now. We're going to be talking about that. Three weeks from now, we're going to be talking about that. And that w when you... When you Get this environment going in your life. You realize that your prayers have power. And when you pray, you should expect some things to happen. Don't just throw up your arms and go, oh, well, I guess I didn't. I prayed, but I guess that didn't work. No, you need to pray for a spirit of understanding. Why? Why? I tithed. I gave. I spoke the word. I did everything I knew to do. And this didn't happen like I thought it would. Don't just throw up your hands and go, oh, well, I, you know, win a few, lose a few. Que sera, sera. I mean, you know, sure is great serving Jesus. Don't do that. Because God has given you a spirit of power. And you need to go into your prayer closet with that spirit on you. That spirit of power that says the word of God works, the power of the Holy Spirit in conjunction with the word of God works, and I'm going to see results in my life. Spirit of power. Creating that environment. <laughs> One of our families, their, uh, their daughter was uh, attacked with a sickness. And... Uh, their daughter, I think, I think their daughter is uh, nine. I think she's eight, nine years old. And uh, she was attacked with a sickness. And she told her mommy, she said, call Pastor Steve. <laughs> call Pastor Steve and tell Pastor Steve to pray for me. Don't you want people to do that for you? Not because, not because you're the pastor. Well, I'm not the pastor, I guess. No, not because you're the pastor, but because you know how to pray. Because you have a spirit of power on you, and people recognize it. Oh, no, I, you know, I, want, I want Michelle Jones to pray for me. Somebody call Michelle Jones. Michelle Jones knows how to pray. I want her to pray for me. Why? Because, because she's, you know, there are so many different superficial things we could try to work into that, but the bottom line is this lady knows how to pray. And so you want to create that, that atmosphere of power around you. Then, of course, the spirit of knowledge that we've already talked about. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says that his divine power, God's divine power, has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue. Through the knowledge of God. Oftentimes, our big issues, the, the things that we deal with in our life, they're knowledge issues. It's just that we don't, we don't know. We don't have the knowledge that we need. 
The Bible says that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. It doesn't say my people are destroyed by the devil. A lot of times we think it's the devil. The devil's not 20, he's not even 20 miles from you. Sometimes we destroy ourselves because we lack the knowledge that we need. So we want a spirit of knowledge. We want the Holy Spirit to be a spirit of knowledge around us. Amen. And then the last one is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. An atmosphere of respect for God. His spirit, his word, and his church. It's important that we allow the Holy Spirit to create the right environment around us and the environment of the fear of the Lord. You know, I'm really shocked when I see some Christians and the stuff that they're willing to put out on Facebook for people to see. One of the first things that hits my mind is this person has no fear of God. I'm not talking about the world. The world has no fear of God. I'm talking about Christians. I'm talking about people in church. People are shaking their Bible and saying hallelujah on Monday and putting crap on Facebook on Tuesday. That's what I'm talking about. We need to have a fear of God. And we need to teach our children to have a healthy respect for God. I'm not talking about being terrified. Jesus, listen, the the veil has been torn and we don't need to be afraid to walk into the presence of God. I'm not talking about that kind of fear. I'm not talking about that we're afraid that God's going to squash us if we make a mistake because Jesus Christ died on the blood and he died on the cross and took our place on the cross so that we could be free. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about a flippant attitude toward God. I realize this is overboard, but you know, when I was a kid, I was not allowed to run in church. I was not allowed to chew gum in church. I was not allowed to wear a hat in church. I was not allowed to talk too loud in church. I was not allowed to play, to play around during church services. I would, I would want to sit with my friends and my mom and my aunt and uncle would let me sit with my friends at church and they had one eye on the preacher and the other eye on me. I couldn't sit back here. Because they they weren't going to do this. Yeah, you can sit with your friends right there. But they're all sitting back here. Well, if you're going to sit with them, they're going to all come right up here where I can see you. I realize that for some of you as parents, that might be a little bit overboard. But I was taught to respect respect the house of God. And I was taught to respect God. And uh, uh, my, my my mom freaked out one time because I dropped a Bible in the floor. I know, I dropped a Bible, dropped a Bible in the floor. I was, I was uh, actually, I was get, getting stuff off the. Uh, she had a Bible on the coffee table, and uh, I wanted to put my feet on the coffee table. So I just picked up the Bible and plop, just, just. I didn't really throw it like a baseball. I just plop, put it in the floor. She, just, she came unglued. <laughs> but I would treat the Word of God like that. Now, I understand this is just paper and, and leather and you know, there's nothing really sacred about it unless it lives in your heart. I understand that. But we need to teach our children to respect God, to respect the house of God, to respect their leadership in, in the church. And we need to teach them to honor the word, to read the word with reverence and to treat, to treat God with reverence. I really, I really believe that that's important. But when we do that, that's a reflection of our own lives. Do we, do we have a healthy respect for God, for his house, for his church, for our relationship with him? Or do we treat it flippantly? That's really, really important. So these are the the seven spirits, the seven characteristics of the Holy Spirit that we want to have in our households. First of all, we want to have this, what I just described, we want to have in our church. Hello. We want to have this in our church. We want to have this in our in our own personal lives, in our hearts. We want to have this environment in our families. We want to create that environment. Let's don't bend to the pressure of the world and the pressure of the culture. And even, can I say this? Let's don't just bend all the time to the pressure of our kids, to the pressure of the neighbors, to everybody else. Oh, you're just old. You're just old-fashioned. You're just, nobody does it like that, Mom. Dad, but everybody does this. Everybody goes here. Everybody, everybody acts like, why are, you, why are you being like that? Because I have a healthy respect for God. And I want you to have one. If you're going to live here in our house, you're going to respect God. Let's all stand. I love being in here. I actually came in here this morning, turned these candles on in the dark, and I actually prayed right here this morning. 
I love being in here. But you know, this is just a, this is just a, a mock-up. This is just a model of something that actually exists in our hearts. The presence and the power of God. The Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is right across from this table of the bread of the presence of God, which represents the Word of God. And it takes the Holy Spirit to illuminate the Word of God so we can take the presence of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and we can go here to the altar of incense and we can intercede. We can pray. We can take that coal from the altar of incense then with our hearts filled with the Holy Spirit and with the Word of God in our mouth and we can go right into the presence of God. It's a great place to be. But listen, this is just a model. This is just a, an illustration. This is a heavenly illustration of what God wants to do in your heart and in your life. My friend, God loves you. And this is a demonstration here of the love of God that Jesus Christ came and paid the price for your sin with his death on the cross so you could be free to experience the Spirit of God, to experience the Word of God, and as we're going to see in a couple weeks, even enter into the presence of God. But what we need to do is to make a decision to follow Christ. You can do that right there where you're standing. In just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to raise your hand, signifying that you want to pray a prayer with me right there where you are. Repenting for your sins, acknowledging that Jesus is the Lord of your life. As we talked about, Jesus is the boss of your life. Of course you want Jesus to be the boss of your life. Haven't you made enough messes on your own? I know. When I found out Jesus could be the Lord of my life, wanted to be the Lord of my life, I was happy to give my life over to Christ because I'd made such a mess of it. Amen. Trying to make this decision and that decision. This didn't work out. That didn't. Finally, somebody knew something about life who was willing to help me. Asking the Holy Spirit to come in and empower you to be the Christian. That the Bible promises you that you can be and to create the environments we talked about today in your life. You can do that right there where you're standing. Would you please bow your heads with me close your eyes? Maybe you've never been to church before. Maybe you've never heard a message like this before. Or maybe you used to serve God and you've fallen away from the Lord. If you went into eternity today, you're not sure what would happen to you. Today's your day. Holy Spirit's drawing you into the kingdom of God. You can sense his presence in this building today. I want to pray a prayer with you right now. Everybody that wants to pray this prayer with me and wants to make a decision to follow Christ, I want you to raise your hand right there where you are. I'm going to pray this prayer with you right there where you are. I see your hand, sweetheart. Who else? Raise your hand right now and say, I want to make a decision to follow Christ. I see that hand. I see this hand over here. Good for you. Good for you. Who else? Several people are already raising their hands. Join them. Make a decision to follow Christ today. Don't leave here without a relationship with Jesus. Without the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. Anyone else? Raise your hand now. You can put your hands down. We've got several people that have raised their hands this morning that want to make decisions to follow Christ. So I'm going to pray a prayer with you right there where you are. I want you to pray this prayer with us. We're all going to pray this prayer with you uh, together because you're about to become our brothers and sisters in the Lord. You ready, church? Let's all pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross so that I could be free from all of my sins, that they could all be washed away, and that the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, that you would come in and live on the inside of me and empower me with these seven attributes. That I can be victorious in every area of my life. And that heaven will be my home. So I repent for my sins. Jesus, you are today, starting today, the Lord of my life. Now, Holy Spirit, empower me to be the Christian that the Bible promises me I can be. As I come to church and I get involved in church life, my life will never be the same after this moment. In Jesus' name, and everybody shouted amen. Let's give a big hand for all those who made decisions to follow Christ today.